Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everyone. My name is Amir Engel, and I'm the chair of the German department at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. I'm talking today with Ofer Ashkenazi on his 2020 book, Anti Heimat Cinema The Jewish Invention of a German Landscape. Ofer, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Amir. Glad to be here. Perhaps before uh, we start talking about the book, maybe you could tell us a little about uh, yourself, uh, your career trajectory, and finally, we'd love to hear more about what it is that brought you to write this book. Yes, thank you very much. I am currently teaching modern European and German history at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and I am the director of the Richard Kebner Minerva Center for German History. This book expands on a topic that I was interested in for quite a long time namely the participation of Jews in constituting and defining the boundaries of German national culture throughout the 20th century. I have to admit that this was not what I had in mind when I started studying history at the university. I grew up in Israel and going through the Israeli education system, I heard a lot about Nazism and the Holocaust, naturally. But my formative years were also the ones of radicalization and the strengthening of the Israeli anti-democratic right. The fear of this phenomenon got me interested in the gradual, intricate transformation from liberal democracy to um, dictatorship or a democratic dictatorship, as uh, Yaakov Talmud called it. Um, two major interests within this framework. Um, One, I was fascinated by the the public discourse leading to this this process during the process and throughout the years of establishing a new regime. And the second thing I wanted is to understand the experience of the people who lived through such a change. How how did they perceive it? What shaped their decision-making process and and so forth? So... (laughs) In a way, most of my efforts as a historian have been directed toward finding interesting answers to these questions. My PhD dissertation and first monograph looked at Weimar visual culture as an arena of liberal propaganda, which endeavored to counter the rise of anti-liberal, anti-bourgeois, if you want, um, ideologies. And this is how I came to consider Jews' contribution to German culture. My second book, Weimar Film and Modern Jewish Identity, argued that some of the most popular German films in the years leading to Hitler's rise to power actually negotiated the experiences of um, acculturation-seeking German Jews who struggled with anti-Semitic biases. I then looked at other aspects of the ways the establishment of Nazi Germany had been perceived by the people who lived through it. For example, I considered anti-war activism of Nazi supporters in the mid-1930s and their collaboration with the International Peace Organization. Or, for instance, uh, I examined the influence of exile from Nazi Germany and the development of national culture in other countries and and how they exported the conflict between um, democratic and anti-democratic voices. The book we are talking about today deals with similar questions, but it expands on other instances of sweeping historical transitions. In this case, three major transitions. The transition from the war, the world, World War I, led by the Kaiser to, the, to a liberal democracy in Weimar Germany, the transition from democracy to violent totalitarianism, and the transition from Nazism to the Cold War, with the formation of liberal democracy in the West and a socialist version of democratic totalitarianism in the East. Okay, excellent. So, okay, before you go on, let me let me set up the the discussion of the book uh, by asking you about the name, the title you chose for the book, Heimat and Anti-Heimat. So maybe before you go really into the discussion, maybe we can preface it by saying a few words about this. What what is Heimat and what is Anti-Heimat? So Heimat is a basic concept or trope in German um, national culture, at least from the latter part of the the 19th century and through the uh, 20th century. Um, Heimat can be translated as homeland or um, home. Uh, a place where you feel at home, a place where you feel secure, 
um, a place that represents who you are and at the same time make you um, or you know produces the self that 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 is your identity is your both communal collective identity and personal identity this is you know the main idea um it's very powerful because it also goes with a parcel of well-known um, cultural imagery um, idioms plot lines and so forth so everybody knows what we're talking about when we're talking about heimat now but then say a few say a few words maybe just very quickly what do, how does Heimat look what does it look like so there are the, the there are several cliches if we talk about how Heimat um, looks like um it, it really depends obviously um let me say it this way so uh, Heimat is so powerful because it can be related to specific German scenery, and that can be different, very different sceneries. It can be one in the Alps or or by the Rhine or in other places or by the North Sea. So it's different landscapes. Um, and in all of them, there are certain cliches that are associated with them, but also associated with the German nationality as a well. whole. Sometimes it's, you know, it's a little village. Uh, with a chair spire and, uh, and the river runs and the forest and so forth. And other times it's uh, the snow-capped mountains uh, and, and so forth. So, but the, if you know a little bit of German culture, you will you will recognize Heimat when you see it. Uh, it's not only imagery, it's, it's also um, certain kinds of um, plot lines and, and emotions that are coming with it. Um, Again, the sense of, of being at home and putting home at the center of experience uh, and everything goes with that. So, uh, again, this is this is a cliche and, and, I, and it's very simplistic way that, uh, to, to um, discuss it. Um, what we also see, and this is the, the anti-Heimat, um, is a way to use this cliche, to use this... Uh, well-known imagery and plot lines in order to critique or or to question what comes um, you know and uh, what comes at at the center of the idea of Heimat. Now, the point uh, that we have to make is that Heimat is a very effective concept for German uh, nationality and from for German nationalism. Um, and also for German folk-based nationalism, because Heimat is the real home of the of the German folk, um, and therefore, if you if you have a folkish uh, mind frame, um, therefore you can say who belongs here and who doesn't belong here. Uh, you can be a German citizen like the Jews, but if you are not belonging in the Heimat, you you do not belong um, in Germany. You're not really belong. You're not part of the folk. You're not really. You don't really belong. Anti Heimat, and and this is the part of culture that I was interested in here, is the to the way to take the the tropes associated with Heimat in order to criticize this idea of, um, you know, some people are essentially belong here and some are not essentially belong. Yeah. Interesting. So just to be clear, Heimat is not a big city, right? No, I didn't say that. So, <laughs> um, yeah, good point. So you could definitely talk about um, the city as Heimat, and we can see that um, in the in the German discourse about Heimat uh, in the early in the early twentieth century, uh, that speaks about the city as some kind of uh, of Heimat. Um, but there, it, it's it's an interesting concept because the city is supposedly ephemeral, supposedly the place that changes, and it's um, it, it contradicts some of the emotions. That are um, associated with with Heimat, um, but there are some there are some ways to to go around it. And and in the book, I 
I talk about it when I, in, in the chapter about the city as as Heimat. Um, but maybe it's it's time to talk about why why Jews are um, fascinated by it. Wait, one before that, still one more question before we actually dive into the book, and that has to do with the time frame that you chose for the book, 1918 to 1968. Now, I I know many books in German history. These are kind of uh, this kind of a strange, uh, a uncommon window uh, as a frame. So I wonder if you can say a few words. Why did you choose this frame and what are you trying to say with this kind of periodization, 1918, 1918 to 1968? Yes, yeah, so there are... Um... A few different reasons for that. One is that I wanted to go beyond the the watershed moments of German history, beyond the January 1933 and May 1945 or or 1949 uh, um, to look at more than one uh, political framework. That's uh, one thing. The other thing is that we are talking um, within this. Time frame. We are talking more or less about, about the same people who are active in the Weimar era, um, going outside, uh, emigrate and uh, or exile, and many of them coming back after 1945. So they are. It's the same people, and if it's not the same people, it's the same circle of people. So some of the people I write about the the post 45 periods. Um, where very young filmmakers at the end of the Weimar period, um, and some of them were only born during the Weimar years and came back um, after 1945 to Germany. There is a, this this biographical connection between Weimar and the early um, Cold War years. Um, another reason for it is that. In 1968, 1969, we start to see uh, a wave of German counter counterculture or counter cinema that um, takes advantage of Heimat in order to criticize German society. Um, coming from the new German cinema, the Germans, mostly non-Jewish filmmakers who were born during the war or just after the war and in the 1960s um, making these uh, critical uh, critical films and they I would argue this is my one of the arguments of the book that they um, let's say influence not to say emulate the uh, Jewish anti heimat uh, imagery and uh, just appropriate it and, and use it for their own uh, their own objectives, which are different from the ones of the or, or somewhat different from the ones of the uh, German Jewish knowledge. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, so maybe at the end you might uh, point us in the direction of a few films that we might watch after finishing the book. Um, the first. Uh... A part of the book discusses Ernst Lubitsch, and he's a fairly well-known um, filmmaker. I think um, from from the others, but you discuss an early film from 1919. Um, so maybe we could start uh, discussing the question of Heimat and anti-Heimat uh, by uh, talking a little bit about this uh, film about Lubitsch. Um, and the way he discusses and contemplates and visions or envisions a Heimat and anti-Heimat. Okay, so um, in order to do that, we need to uh, st take a step backward and ask what what is the Jewish take on uh, Heimat in Germany? And uh, because Heimat was so important for German nationality, uh, Jews were fascinated by it as well, um, and they gave several different answers to the to the challenge of Heimat. So, if Heimat is the place where we do not belong, some Jews said, "No, actually, we we are be we we do belong here. We we were here from the you know 11th century, 12th century, and and show all the uh, the the long history of Jews in Germany." Um, and others said, well, you know, we are 
our Heimat is not in Germany as a landscape, but in Germany as a culture, German culture and so forth, like Heine. Um, but there are two other answers that we see a lot in, in the films that she has made in Germany. Um, and one of them, I think the best way to, to capture it was uh, by um, Donald Zweig, who said, you know, the problem of, of the Germans is that they take Heimat too seriously, um, and therefore they never, they never move, they never develop, uh, they never evolve. What they need is, is the Jews who are, um, you know, they're moved from one place to another. They feel at home in more than one place, and that inserts some uh, some evolution into German uh, German nationality. That's why the Germans need the Jews. Um, and then there is the answer by uh, it, many said it, but Kurt Tucholsky said it's uh, in, a, in a very nice way in his um, in his satirical book uh, Deutschland Deutschland über alles. Um, he says, well, you know, I'm what is a place. And we belong in that place, but it's not the place where you are uh, rooted because you lived there as a as a farmer for thousands of years. It is the place that you know and love from your hikes on the weekends, from your readings and from your writings, uh, from 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 you know knowing the language, the, the names of the flowers, and and so on and so forth. Um, so what you see is is that and I think in in Lubitsch from 1918, Mayo House Berlin, uh, I think this is he basically takes Tucholsky's idea. And this is uh, mind you, more than 10 years before Tucholsky writes it. Uh, so, but he takes the same idea and he makes a, a comedy out of it. Um, the plot line uh, is actually stolen. That I I found out when I started writing about it. Uh, it is stolen from a different film that was made during the war uh, that had nothing to do with with Jews, uh, but um, Lubitsch Jewifies it, and he tells a story about Meyer, who is the most stereotypical Jew, who goes from Berlin, where he belongs, uh, to the mountains in Tyrol. Um, he behaves very um, yeah. Jewishly, stereotypically speaking. Um, he doesn't really care about the, the environment. Uh, he litters everywhere. He doesn't care where he is. Um, uh, he, he doesn't have any respect for nature or for the locals uh, at the place. Um, and he really, what he wants to have is uh, uh, like a, Roman, a romance outside of, the, of his marriage. Um, that's that's what it is. So it's it looks like um, anti-Semitic films almost. Um, but then when you look closely, you see that um, actually Lubitsch, Lubitsch uses all the cliches about Jews, but also about Heimat to show how ridiculous they are. So um, for example, he goes to the um, to this Tyrolean village that's supposed to be. Um, like, like, um, the, the, the symbolic, the, the prototypical Heimat, um, but he, he finds no one that actually lives there. Everybody is a tourist just like him. No one really cares about that. No one has any respect, uh, for the place just like him. Um, and everyone wants just like him to have fun over the weekend. Uh, and he blends in very nicely. Um, so the, the the whole film makes fun of the idea of 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 Heimat, the, you know, the the cliche, the pathos ridden idea of Heimat, uh, and shows how the how the stereotypical Jew can can be part of it. It also shows how if you once you understand Heimat as a place of recreation. Um, this is also the place where Jews and non-Jews can come together and be very good friends. And this is the the end of the uh, of the film. Mm -hmm. So this is the way to create a new German Jewish society is by taking Heimat for what it really is, which is a a, 
a kind of a, a, a spa town, basically. Uh, it, it's not necessarily the spa town, like a place where um, urban bourgeois or men and women actually go go there over the weekend as part of their leisure culture, mm-hmm. um, as part of being a bourgeois urbanite. This is mm-hmm. what you are. And so the so the community is not a German Turkish community, it's a community of the bourgeoisie, the educated bourgeoisie. Uh, who hang out in the in the weekend in the mountain somewhere and yeah. have a good time. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Then uh, after you uh, finish uh, discussing Luvitch, you turn to another uh, a film, this one by E.A. Dupont, uh, titled The Gaia Valley from 1921. Tell us about this film and how it kind of continues the complication of Heimat and anti-Heimat uh, during the Weimar era. So this film, I think this is the film to start with. It just it was made a couple of years later, so I... Um, so I, I wrote it as the second chapter, but this uh, is the film to start with because the Gaia Valley, Valley is the name of a girl. Uh, oh. and, and Gaia Valley is is like a very popular, it used to be a very popular novel. It was written in the 1870s and by the 1920s, uh, yeah, many people read it, read it and it's supposed to be like, you know, a, a typical Heimat novel with all the elements that you have there. Um, DuPont make, uh, makes the first rendition, film, cinematic rendition of this, um, of this novel. Uh, and after that came another uh, four or five, even six, if you count the television uh, series that were made after it. Um, so this is, a, this is a real Heimat film that was made during the Weimar by a Jewish filmmaker. Um, uh, during the Nazi era, by uh, a very uh, enthusiast, uh, the Nazi enthusiast film, filmmaker, and then in West Germany, and then uh, as a parody, um, uh, you know, pornographic parody in the 70s, um, and then again and again and again. So um, it's a very important film in the German um, Heimat cinema and everything that is around it. Uh, and what you see is that many of the things that DuPont is doing in this uh, film, um, the, the scenery, the way he portrays Valley, the way he portrays other people, um, and even the plot that he makes from the, from the novel, which is not exactly the same, all of that was copied by later filmmakers, including um, during the the Nazi period, so uh, it really contributed to to Heimat culture. It really contributed to Heimat cinema, but at the same time, um, it has a very strong critical or perspective on uh, the whole idea of Heimat. So I, I will not uh, go over all the plot here, but uh, the point is that it's about. Uh, uh, secluded village in the Alps. Um, Valley lives with her father. She's in love with one person. Uh, her father doesn't want her to marry him. He marry, tries to marry, marry her off with another person. Um, she doesn't want to do it, so he exiles her to the mountains. Um, after, after a while, she comes back. She sees that her former lover lives with another woman, um, and uh, she she orders someone to to shoot him as as it happens, as one does, uh, as one does in this case, <laughs> yes. Uh, um, but but fortunately, he is just injured; he's not dead. And he tells her this is uh, that the other woman is his sister, not his new lover, and there is this happy ending. Um, the point is that um, this is the classic cliche of Heimat, and it's a terrible, terrible place. In mm-hmm. Pontsville, um, this is a very violent place. The people, the, the violence is very graphic. You can see how people beat each other with sticks and with knives and and axes, and uh, and 
you know, burn the houses of each other and shoot each other and kills the animal. So it, it's terrible. And it's even worse because there is no there is no sense of community there. There, when there is a, a danger to the community, everybody runs to their own place, uh, and no one helps the weak people in the village. Um, and and it's supposed to be a place where you feel at home, but the homes are destroyed again and again in this in this film. Um, and and one of the changes in the plot from between the film and uh, and the novel is that in the novel it ends when uh, Vali and Yosef and Olava going, are going back to their home, uh, which doesn't happen uh, in the film. In the film, they they never go home because there is no home to go to. Go to. Right. So, uh, so this is a, a terrible place. And Dupont basically said, you know what? You wanted Heimat. You wanted this the cliche of Heimat. You wanted this community that is tied together, secluded from the world. Um, this is terrible. This is a terrible place. And if you add to that, this is a very Christian place. There is no place for Jews there. Mm-hmm. Now they have the, the crosses on their necklaces and everything revolves around the church and so on. Um, yeah, so this is a place without Jews, a Heimat without Jews, and it's a terrible, terrible place. So this is uh, the poor's take on, on Heimat. Before we move on, I, I'm curious, I am so the interpretation that you suggest is is a commonplace, or I mean, how was how were the films understood during the Weimar era? Uh, how were they received? Uh, so this is a very interesting question. I what I try to do when I when I read the films, I I look at two things. I look first of all the films themselves as a visual text, so it said, so to speak. Um, what I look there is the way some some uh, images are echoed, and they are echoed from other films. They are echoed from books. There are so many uh, painting books about uh, about Heimat. There are so many photography books about Heimat. There are poems about Heimat, and and I look at how the films echo these these images these these concepts or textual images or visual images and how they play with it and what meanings they give to it um and at the same time i look at how they were um, reviewed at the time how how the critics thought about them um and and you can see that um many of the films i wrote about confused the critics Mm-hmm. They don't know what to do with that. So they, you can, you can see that. You know, in the case of of Dupont's film, uh, they say it's a, you know, it's supposed to be a cliche about Heimat, but some something doesn't work there. So it's a very strong Heimat film, but something doesn't work. So they don't. It's not read the way I read it as a, as a Jewish take on Heimat. Uh, but on the other hand, it it is clear that something there is is awkward. And so I think this is the this is the part of this film because they play on on both sides. They on one hand they provide good um, entertainment, mm-hmm. uh, very good German entertainment, uh, melodrama or comedy, Lubitsch or or you know, you know other other types of popular genres, um, and at the same time. They have this criticism that underlies the whole the whole film. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, it's I, I'm not saying that I have, nowhere I say, you know, Dupont realized that this is what he wants to do, right? I don't know. Sometimes right. some filmmakers do say it, and then I uh, and then I highlight it, of course. But in most cases, they don't. They just. Um, they try to give their take on Heimat. And the fact that they are coming from a Jewish background, which means, by the way, I, I don't care if they are, you know, religiously Jews or, or ethnically Jews, the fact that as, as Jews, they occupy a certain place in German society, um, which, again, we can use the cliche of insider, outsider, or something like that. But it's a, it's a place where you are well situated within society but at the same time uh, you are always a little bit um on the side or or people will point to you as 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 different 
Um, and, and this is the point of view that they communicate again and again and again, and they use HIMOT to do that. Interesting. So now the the next uh, the next discussion goes to um, a, another figure. It also moves to a, a later time period. Uh, we're talking about Helma Oleski, uh, and he discusses uh, a, a Weimar era film. But you also discuss uh, the work he did in Palestine for the labor Zionist organization. Uh, after escaping, basically, Germany in the 1930s. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about uh, about who Leski was and a little bit about his film and how does it fit into your uh, project, your understanding and your way of uh, interpreting Heimat and Andy Heimat, of course. Yes, well, Helma Leski really deserves a, a book for himself. And there are some very good books about him, very uh, good studies about him. I can uh, recommend uh, um, Amos Morris Wright's writing on on Helmut Lersky, well, mostly about his um, photography. Uh, very briefly, I will say that he um, he had a very interesting life, uh, or even lives, I can say, born in uh, Strasbourg. Um, immigrated to Milwaukee in the U.S., uh, worked in the theater, started taking phot photographs, came back during World War I to Germany, to Berlin, uh, became a very famous photographer and then cinematographer, um, took part as a cinematographer in some of the most famous films of the of the Weimar Republic. Uh, the, obviously, uh, the most uh, important one is uh, Metropolis, but many, many others. Um, and then in the early 1930s, he goes to uh, Palestine and becomes the artist of the Zionist movement. Like the, his, by then he's in his 60s, he's like the old sage um, of the Zionist movement. Um, he teaches many people how to, how to photograph, how to make, uh, how to make films. Uh, and in 1935, he does this very uh, influential um, documentary film, or or um, what what in German would be called a Kulturfilm, um, for the Zionist movements called Avoda. Now, normally labor um, Avoda, which is yes, labor. Sorry, yeah. Um, normally, when People write about Helmut Lersky in this regard. Um, they write about the way he transferred ideas from German nationalism mm -hmm. to uh, Jewish nationalism in Palestine. And I did it too. I, I wrote I, I wrote an article about it. But actually, here I I, I argued the opposite. So um, he definitely transferred the idea from the German identity discourse into the Jewish identity discourse. And did it brilliantly in very um, uh, convincing way. Um, but what he transferred was not Heimat or the the concept of Heimat and the sentiments of Heimat, but actually the sentiments related to anti Heimat. Mm -hmm. And that goes back to um, a film. He was a cinematographer in the late nineteen twenties. Both um, uh, of, of um, an anti heimat film in uh, Germany, um, a film about the destruction of Heimat by by the machines. Right. And it ends with total destruction, but uh, uh, but but it's not a tragedy. It actually ends with uh, the idea that this destruction is needed to feed the, the hunger, to give work to the people and so forth. When he comes back and do the film Labor, Palestine, 1935, um, he will do that. He will uh, make a film about the danger of Heimat, of the idea of um, a folk, of ethnic group that belongs to a certain landscape and only it belongs to, to the landscape and it is rooted in it and so forth. He <laughs> works very hard to, to give us a, a twisted notion of, of Heimat, uh, a way that you cannot really 
be part of this this idea of climate. What, what does that look like? So it's uh, it's a combination of how you. I think that the most um, striking thing is how you um, shoot the landscape. So the landscape is always um, not as Heimat's supposed to look like. He always takes it from uh, from an angle that um, gives us some kind of a claustrophobic mm. uh, feeling because it's uh, um, the the camera is tilted it's tilted downward and and so you don't you normally don't see the um, the horizons. Um, and, uh, it, again, it's, it's just like in many cases and, and, uh, I show it in details in the chapter, in many cases, he goes to a scene that is supposed to look like Heimat, uh, but it is twisted every time. It's a little bit different. It's every time it's not as it's supposed to look like. So if you are um, if you are coming from Germany, if you're a Jew, a Jew coming from Germany in the 1930s, uh, 1930s, and you are well familiar with the visual manifestations of Heimat, um, this will look awkward to you. This will yeah. look strange, uh, and I think this is what he was he was going for. Um, it's I, I don't think it's very surprising that he continues to do all these kind of, of Zionist propaganda films, but the first moment he came after 1945, he leaves the country back to Central Europe. Mm-hmm. So he had a problem with this kind of ethnic nationalism that uh, became prominent within the Zionist movement. Interesting. 